So um, we'll begin with the chanting of our uh, introductory verses or our invocation verses, and um, hopefully everyone can see the screen and follow along. We do ask that uh, there's so much power in, in chanting these mantras or these shlokas together, uh, and in also uh, reciting the English translation together. Uh, because of the, the issues with the audio lag, we're not able to um, do that in the conventional sense. So we're asking that everyone um, just make sure that you're still muted out. But while you're muted out, please do chant along um, at home and recite along as I, as I do um, audibly for everyone here. Narayanam namaskritya naram chaiva narottamam devim sarasvatim vyasam tato jayam udirayet. Before reciting the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is the very means of conquest, one should offer respectful obeisances unto the personality of Godhead, Narayana, unto Nara Narayana Rishi, the supermost human being, unto Mother Saraswati, the goddess of learning, and unto Srila Vyasadev, the author. Shu Shusho Shadadhanasya Vasudeva Kataruchihi Shyan Mahat Sevaya Vipraha Punya Tirtavanishe Vanat. O twice born sages, by serving those devotees who are completely freed from all vice, great service is done. By such service, one gains affinity for hearing the messages of Vasudev. Shrinvatam Svakata Krishnaha Punya Shravana Kirtanaha Hridyantaha Stohya Abhadrani Vidhunoti Surhitsatam Shri Krishna, the personality of Godhead, who is the Paramatma or Super Soul in everyone's heart and the benefactor of the truthful devotee, cleanses desire for material enjoyment from the heart of the devotee who has developed the urge to hear his messages, which are in themselves virtuous when properly heard and chanted. Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavatyuttama Shloke Bhaktir Bhavati Naishtiki. By regular attendance in classes on the Bhagavatam and by rendering of service to the pure devotee, all that is troublesome to the heart is almost completely destroyed, and loving service unto the personality of Godhead, who is praised with transcendental songs, is established as an irrevocable fact. Tadarajastamo bhavaha kamalo bhadayas chaye cheta eter anavidham stitham satve prasidati. As soon as irrevocable loving service is established in the heart, the effects of nature's modes of passion and ignorance, such as lust, desire, and hankering, disappear from the heart. Then the devotee is established in goodness and he becomes completely happy. Evam prashana manaso bhagavat bhakti yogataha bhagavat tattva vigyanam mukta sangasya jayate. Thus established in the mode of unalloyed goodness, the person whose mind has been enlivened by contact with transcendental, I'm sorry, devotional service to the Lord, gains positive scientific knowledge of the personality of Godhead in the stage of liberation from all material association. Pidyate hridaya grantis chidhyante sarva sangshayaha shyante chasya karmani Drishta evat manishvare. Thus, the knot in the heart is pierced and all misgivings are cut to pieces. The chain of fruitive actions is terminated when one sees the self as master. Ugram viram maha vishnung jvalantam sarvato mukham nirsingham bhishanam bhadram mrityur mrityung namam yaham. I bow down to Lord Narasimha, who is a ferocious and heroic form of Lord Vishnu. He is effulgent and burning from every side. He is terrific, auspicious, and the death of death personified.
So we'll begin uh, with just a, a quick um, check-in on the exercise from the last session. So if you were able to join us, um, and I don't know if uh, Mungal Arati Mataji is on the call yet. Mungal, are you there? I'm here. Yes, can we make sure Mungal is unmuted? Oh yes, there she is. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. So, Mungal, I thought since it was uh, since you led the the wonderful session last week, um, let me just see if I can get this slide loaded up. But if you could maybe take us through a little recap of what the exercise was, and um, if uh, any of our participants from last week uh, were present today, are present today, and and are willing to share, maybe we can have a couple of shares of. Um, everyone's experience with the exercise last week? Sure. Um, so the exercise from last week, is it, oh yeah, yes, there it is. And um, it's reflecting on a relationship in which I'm convinced that I'm exclusively right. Um, and we're finding at least one positive takeaway from the other perspective. So one positive takeaway from the other side. So what we encouraged last week was that if we're stuck, we can get creative. We can inquire from a balanced hagua, either the devotees or the text, um, our acharyas through image, we chant and hear more. I won't read all of them. So um, if anyone would like to share an experience, it's up to you. Um, and then I would ask that you keep it somewhat broad and general with names removed. Thank you. It's a great, uh, great yeah. caveat, Mungla. Glad you said that. So we really do want to encourage interactivity. I know sometimes in with social distancing and the sort of um, impersonal nature of video conferencing and Zoom, um, sometimes it's hard to get into that flow of of being interactive and, and um, having a discussion. But that's such an important and, and critical feature of our coming together for Bhagavad Shravana. So we really want to encourage um, as people are, as devotees are, are comfortable, but, but please do um, go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, join in the conversation. And, and Karuna Gorangaji, if we can just make sure that everyone has the ability to do that, um, we would love to have just a, a couple of reflections or shares from the experience. So I, I, I feel like everyone's a little bit shy. Um, we also, um, we may be expecting uh, some, some more folks to join us a little bit later um, in the call as they're able to. So um, uh, I can just share something. Um, I don't mean to monopolize the, uh, the discussion here, but, uh, but maybe I can at least just get us started. Um, so I really appreciated this exercise and um, without going into so much detail because of confidentiality, um, but I, I have been experiencing um, a little bit of a, um, a tension with a devotee with whom I um, actually was quite close and, and um, worked really closely on some projects in the past, but feel like we've really developed very different visions. Um, and uh, I feel like I have been very much locked into um, kind of assuming the worst of this person, if I'm being honest, and assuming that um, their difference in vision for for this project um, was coming from more from a place of uh, kind of being being dismissive or disregarding um, the points that I was trying to make or where I was coming from, and um, so I was really kind of struggling with that. And if I'm honest, I'm still very much struggling with that. But, uh, but in trying to apply this exercise, um, one of the things that, that I tried to sort of meditate on or reflect on 
um, was this person's experience. And um, in particular, this person has actually been through a lot in their own Krishna conscious journey. Um, they're a longtime practitioner of, of bhakti. And, um, and actually, just the more I reflected on, and I know some of the specific experiences that this, this person um, went through, um, both positive and negative, both um, really kind of amazing experiences, but also challenges, um, it, it helped to really kind of flesh out for me, um, not only where this person was coming from, but also just a, a kind of a newfound respect for, um, for you know, uh, what they carry with them. And, um, and kind of, um, even if I don't always see eye to eye, and I'm definitely not seeing eye to eye with them right now, um, but just to kind of like um, respect and, and appreciate that where they're coming from is not, is not um, a place of sort of making decisions whimsically or lightly, but actually has a lot of real world experience and in some ways more world, real world experience than I do. Um, and it just helped to kind of humble me and, and remind me that, um, that as this exercise points out, that there, there's, um, there's positive takeaways from recognizing the other, other person's perspective. Um, so that, that was incredibly helpful for me. Um, does anyone else have anything to share either on that point or something related or anything else just building off of um, last week's theme of um, appreciating the sort of both and and appreciating the other perspective? Okay. And um, um, Venkata Bhattaji? Yes. Uh, I'm, ha I'm happy to be super brief um, if you want someone else to share, but this is more, this may feel like a more personal uh, exercise for many people, and so it, it's totally fine if no one um, is feeling to care about this at this sure. time. Sure. If you want someone else to share, I'm happy to, but I happy to get on with the class and, and hear from, from all of you. Yeah, thank you for that. Okay, um, so we'll go ahead and um, I'm gonna turn it over to Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. I'm also gonna stop the screen sharing so that we can get um, Prabhuji's slideshow loaded up. So just give us a, a, a moment and um, once again, let's give a, a, a very warm, heartfelt, Welcome, uh, welcome back to our, our dear friend and mentor, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. Hare Krishna, am I audible, am I audible and visible both? Yes, Prabhu. Audible also, yes. Thank you, very, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to be here with you. If the audio goes down anytime, please let me know. And uh, I'll be taking this in two distinct parts. One is the slideshow and the second is the verses. So we will go over, we will basically alternate between the verses and the slideshow. So... I'll recite the verses and explain the verses. So it will be both a Bhagavatam study and a addressing of a particular theme. So uh, this topic, the main theme, there will be several themes which we'll go as we study the verses. But the main theme I'll focus on is this theme of how pra Prahlad responds to Hiranyakashipu's questions. So a quick, a quick context before we move forward. Here, what is exactly happening is that uh, Prahlad is still a small boy and he's been taken to his uh, teacher's his school for learning. And then his father comes and asks him, what did you learn? What is the best thing that you learned in school? And in the previous verse, he says, Shravana, Kirtana, Vishnu. The famous verse, basically, he says that the activity is that had comprised devotion to Vishnu are the best. And whatever activities help us to increase our attraction to Vishnu, uh, learning those activities and le learning about those activities is the best education. This is certainly not what Hiranyakashipu was expecting. 
and then uh, Haribol, we challenge and row. text 20. Yeah. Sorry, just one thing. I think the network is running out. So if you switch off your video, the bandwidth will just be used for the audio because we are getting a slight breakup in the... Thank you. Oh, really? Okay. What about now? Yeah, it's Another sounding one? better. Yeah, it's audible. Yes, okay. If it breaks, I, I have a, one backup network also. I have, in case it's not good at all, I will log in from my laptop. Currently, I'm logging in from my phone. Let me know if there's any problem. Sure, problem. Yeah. Okay. Should I try or the video is not really needed? Right now, should I try or not required? It'll just take some time. Yeah, I think it's fine for now. If it continues a little more, I'll surely bring it up. Okay, sure. Thank you. So let's go to the words for today. We will start from the tour text 25 and we'll move forward. There's another uh, Veda based page which I had shared. I hope you got that. Okay, can you go to the top so that you can? I had given the right view, it's the advanced view where only the words and the translation is seen. Just go to the top, top of the page, right up to the top, please. Okay, you're there. This is fine. Just start from 25. You'll just have to move less if the other options are covered, but that's okay. So this is text 25. Can you just increase it a little bit if possible that it can be seen? Yeah, here you could just remove the purport. Yeah, you went to the top. Just remove the purport from there. Remove the translation. Just keep the words. When you okay. went to the top of the page, just go to the page up fully on that page. Okay. Just go full. You have, you have gone there once. Yes. Just top of the page. Okay. No, no, no. The whole page, just the top. Yeah, here. Just unclick the translations. Yeah, yeah. No, what did you do? No. Okay. So you just want to advanced view. Uh -huh. In the advanced view only. In the click advanced view. Okay. This one, Prabhu? No, the diff. Okay, leave it. Okay, it's fine. No problem at all. I should have explained. Okay, the verse is visible for everybody, isn't it? I think the uh, English might be easier to recite or to understand. So please show the English one. It's the Sanskrit. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So now here, let's look at what is happening in this. Uh, by English, I meant the English transliteration. Uh, the not the English translation, but the not the Rome, Roman translation. Basically. So, on hearing these words of his son, when he heard these, he turned towards the sons of his guru. That refers to Shanda and Amarka. So there are multiple generations going on. So his guru is Shukracharya. And they are in some ways, so the next generation is being turned, trained by the next generation. So the next generation is Shanda and Amarka. And his Harikashmu's next generation is his son. So then the words Sutta and Putra are the same things. Guru Putram Vachetam Rusha. He spoke with anger. Prasphurit hmm? Adharha. Adharha refers to his lips. So he was so enraged that his lips started trembling. And normally a person's lips tremble when a person is angry and is trying to control the anger. You just explode and you trying to not explode at that time. So it was it was infuriating for him. Now what was so infuriating? It is say there is there are various kinds of polarizing atmospheres in the world. Maybe say in between India and Pakistan there is tension. In say currently between America and China there's some tension. Or say in America between the uh, between the Democrats and Republicans, the, the Republicans, there's a tension. And normally, when somebody in one's own party starts speaking, 
something completely in praise of the other party. It's, it's outrageous. The, uh, if in a democratic convention somebody starts praising Trump or in somebody in a Republican convention starts, starts praising the Democrats, people will be enraged because oh, oh, this, at least they're just a verbal confrontation. But between Hiranyakashipu and the Devtas, there's a physical confrontation. There had been war, there had been, it was brutal. So at that time, just speaking the name of Vishnu and not just speaking the name of Vishnu, but speaking of devoting oneself to Vishnu was such an outrageous thing uh, for Hiranyakashipu to hear that he just couldn't control himself. <coughs> now, Prahlad is just a small child. At this stage, he's five years old. So he's one, now it's his, so Hiranyakashipu's anger initially is not directed toward Prahlad. It is directed toward someone else. That is his teachers. So can you go to the next verse? So he focuses on, actually, oh, this will be very messy to me. Uh, if you have to change the words, okay. Brahma bandho kim etate vipaksham shreta sata asaram grahito palo maam anadritya durmate. So, Brahma bandho kim etate. Brahm, keep the Sanskrit itself, please. Uh, Brahma bandho kim etate. So the way he is addressing is also very significant. He doesn't refer to the Shanda and Amarka as Brahmanas. He calls them as Brahma Bandho. Now Brahma Bandho is a relative of a Brahmana. It's, uh, it's uh, if we understand the Vedic context, it's actually an insult to a person. That means that you are actually not a Brahmana, you're just related to a Brahmana. Say, uh, if uh, somebody is, is, you say somebody is not, you are born in the family, but you are not actually worthy of the family. Then, that's an insult to the person. So, Hrindakashi was so angry that he refers to Shanda Damarka that you are Brahma Bandhu, that you are unqualified sons of a Brahmana as Prabhupada translated. Kime Tatte. What is this happening? What is he speaking? Vipaksham Shreta Asata. Vipaksham. Vipaksham is the opposite party. Paksha is the party. Vipaksha is the opposite party. Shreta Asata. How is he taken shelter of the opposite party? How is he Asata? This is horrible. So, Sata means that which is true and asata which is the untrue, which is real or unreal, good or bad, the polarity. So he says, from a demoniac's demon's perspective, this is terrible. How could you do something? How could this happen? So, asaram grahito balo asaram. Sara is essence, meaning. Asaram is meaningless. This is nonsense. Grahito balo. That what is this that you are taught to the child? Maam anadritya durmate. That he is anadritya. Adar is respect. Anadritya is that he is not respecting me. Durmate. And you see, oh foolish teacher, what have you done? Durmate means it's interesting at this point that he is not condemning his son. He's condemning the teachers of his son. So, Hiranyakashipu talks about a theme over here, which is implicit over here that the actions of the teacher reflect, actions of a student reflect on the teacher. So, we'll come to this theme, but let's recite, let's go to the next verse and then we'll go to the slideshow. Can you go to text 27? Maam Anadritya. So, Maam Anadritya means that you have disrespected me. 
so <clears throat> you have disrespected me and how is so the praise of the opposition is taken by hiranyakashipu as a disrespect to himself how dare he disrespect me like this so then text 27 santiya asadhavo loke durmaitras chatmaveshinah desham udetyagam kale roga pataki namiva santi ya asadhavo loke there are indeed asadhavo loke there are people in this world who are dishonest who are bad people so oh, it's not just bad asadhavo means here the idea is that they are actually considered good people they think that they show that they are good people but they are bad people asadhavo loke durmaitraha chatmaveshinah durmaitra chatmavesh chatmaveshinah means they are inimical they are not maitras they are enemies but they cover up they take on a garb as if they are friends chatmaveshinah so what is he referring to he say that you are you are you are acting like my friends you are acting like my, the te- you are supposed to be the teachers of my son but you are acting like my enemies and then he gives a example which could be relevant in today's context interesting desha muditya agham kale so agham sins of a person udat udet udet means they rise like the sun rises uday kale in due course a person sins rise roga pataki nami va roga pataki nami va that roga is disease pataki is sinful so what is he saying is a sinful person that their sins in due course of time manifest as disease in their body so similarly your devious mentality is manifesting sometimes a sinful person might be might be might look healthy might be wealthy and might be looking normal but then in due course disease comes in their body so roga pataki nami va so the idea is what is he saying the basic point is making is that you are double crossing me you are cheating me instead of teaching my son my glory is you have taught him the glories of my opponent my enemy and therefore you are my enemies durmaitras so sometimes when we are reading the uh, sanskrit just the, because we don't usually converse in this language so often the emotions they don't come out so easily but actually if you look at the words being used over here these are these are furious words this is uh, you are a hypocrite you are a cheater you are an imposter you are a traitor and he is strongly condemning Shridhar Swami explained. Shridhar Swami is a prominent commentator on our scriptures. So he explains uh, in his Gita commentary, and he also repeats it in his Bhagavatam commentary, that when the scripture describes stories, uh, the scripture describes stories in the light of the purpose to be served. So it's not that the exhaustive details are described. just like say if we experience something maybe we experience some unpleasant incident when we go out there is some quarrel altercation now we might describe that altercation you know this these two people had a quarrel you might describe it in in 2 minutes you could describe it in 2 hours so here just these two words or two sentences are given in the bhagavatam our rachaka has said that bhagavatam can be elaborated much more also so these two sentences they indicate the magnitude of the anger of hiranyakashipu wherein he is completely holding the teachers responsible and even calling them as traitors so can we go to the slide show now okay so we look at hiranyakashipu what are his responses the first thing he says is can we go to the next slide yeah hiranyakashipu says that the actions of students reflect on the teacher 
In fact, the, generally, the smaller the student, the, uh, it's a, there, are there are teenagers, there are older students, then we might say they have their own nature and their personality. But it's a five-year-old boy. It is normally, and even in his school, we go to, if a child is misbehaving, then what the authority says, okay, call the parents of that child. So call the parents. So basically, children themselves are not considered responsible. They're so small. They are quite moldable. There are different uh, uh, different models about uh, parenting. It's of course a different subject. But the idea is that children, small children especially, seem to be like one model, one metaphor is that they are like wet clay. And if they have been shaped in a particular way, that's because of the person who's shaping them. Now, in this case, Hiranyakashipu has sent his son to his tea school, and then his son comes back and is teaching this, say, speaking this. So he says, Nobody in my home would speak like this, would teach him like this. It's you who taught him. So, the, basically, however we act, that reflects on those who are connected with us. So, for each of us, we represent a tradition, we represent our spiritual master, we represent maybe our dynasty. We all belong to different bigger groups and our actions reflect on that group. So that is the uh, Hiranyakashipu's furious and is targeting his, uh, the, the teachers of his son. And now what, are the, what is the response of the teachers? Can we go back to the slideshow? Sorry, to the, not the slideshow, the verse. So, they, they respond by speaking only one verse over here. You know, Gautama, the, the page view that I had given you, you, just click on that link, all the verses will come in one sequence. You won't have to go like this, you want to change the page. You change it now, and next time when you have the slideshow, maybe you can work on that. Thank you. Shri Guru Putra Vacha Namat Pranitam Namat Pranitam Napara Pranitam Suto Vadati Shatavin Rashatro Naisar Kikiyam Matiras Rajan Nyachamanum Kadadas Mana. So Namat Pranitam, Napara Pranitam. Pranitam is taught, educated. I have not taught it like this. Namat Pranitam. The first response to Guru Putra, that is Shandra and Amarka, they are saying. Their first response is a vehement denial. Namat Pranitam. We didn't do it. Napara Pranitam. Nor did anyone else in my school, in my academy taught this. Suto Vadatya Esha Tavendra Shatru. Suto, what your son is Suto Vadatya, what your son is speaking, Esha, Tavendra Shatru. And he is addressing Hiranyakashipu uh, in very specific categorical terms. Tava, you are Indra Shatru. Says, we all know that you are the enemy of Indra. And now Indra Shatru is actually a glorification. It's a respectable address. It's like somebody say is the world tennis champion. You say you are the rival of the tennis champion. World number one rival. Oh, really? I mean, you must also be a great player. So he's telling them, we know about these divisions. We know that there is the Devutas and the Asuras are opposite. We know Tavendra Shatru. So you are the enemy of Indra. Sutavadatti. And your son is speaking like this. Neither I nor anyone else in our academy has taught this. Then, how is this come up? Naisargiki yam matirasya rajan. It's a beautiful verse. Naisargiki yam mati. Mati is consciousness. Naisargiki is nisarga in Hindi and Sanskrit means nature. Naisargiki yam means natural. This is his natural consciousness. Asya rajan. Because it is a natural consciousness so therefore give it up 
don't your anger towards us we are not kada adahas man we are not done anything at all so this nisarg kiyam this is a very interesting point can we go back to the slide show basically within within parenting within uh, any kind of uh, training setting there is always this debate can you go next slide please yeah so there is what is called as a nature nurture debate that means say are when we are we become a particular way is it because of we are born with a particular nature or is it because we are nurtured in a particular way and that's what makes us like that so this debate might be there with respect to leadership so are people born as leaders or are people made leaders through training it could go to any success in life right if any field could it be say if somebody is a great musician so can people by system by training systematically can they become musicians or if we consider say writing nowadays writing as a course is a master in fine arts and uh, such courses are becoming more are becoming quite widespread but it's interesting that practically none of the celebrated writers ever did any such courses uh, the graduates from most of these courses it's not that they become the the best writers either in the quality or in terms of uh, uh, in terms of fame or whatever else so with respect to there, there is this debate that and yet although although many of these top writers they don't they themselves never went to writing school they will they will come and some of them will come and teach at these writing schools so is say for example writing teachable or is writing ability something which comes in it so now from a spiritual from a philosophical perspective we understand that we are born or in the particular nature that nature is that we are souls who have been in previous lives and when we come from this previous life to this life the in, the actions that we have done the impressions that they have caused on our mind they are there with us and that's how we are born and if parents have multiple children parents can make out each child is different even from the childhood they can see the difference sometimes uh, some children even all children cry but some children they cry in a way that they are going to bring the whole house down some babies even when they are in the crib they are looking out of the grip thinking when am i when am i going to take the house out so that's not necessarily being bossy but some people have that that nature they want to be in charge they want to be in control so the idea is that there are a, there is a innate nature by innate what it means is that's what this is what we bring into this body before we come before we are born and nurture refers to the upbringing so the upbringing influences us so for example the first the uh, the, the upbringing the major part of the upbringing is done by the parents another part of the upbringing is by the education system by the school the teachers so here tavendra shatru so what shanta and amarka are saying is there is nothing of nurture in this you are the you are the enemy of indra so obviously you will not teach him to worship the lord of indra that is vishnu and we haven't done that so this is not because of any nurture it is the nature of this child naisargiki naisargiki this is just natural for him now what is natural is sometimes considered to be unchangeable now it's not entirely unchangeable there are many aspects to the nature that we have but some people are just born say with respect to music tone deaf if they are tone deaf no matter what they do it's not going to make any difference they just they just can't make any sense of music if they try to learn it so we all can learn to certain extents but there are certain things which we bring and they can act like a big leap 
So, or a big step forward. It's like in a race, sometimes some people have a head start. So, if we, if it's with respect to good qualities, then we have a head start. If we have brought some good qualities in our nature, if it's with bad qualities, then it's it's we have a head start from the negative side. So here, uh, the the teachers of Hiranyakashipu or teachers of Pralad are telling Hiranyakashipu that we are not responsible. Why? Because naisargiki, you know, this is natural for them. Can you go back to the slide? Sorry, the verses. So now, now Hiranyakashipu's anger turned towards Prahalad. So first he is angry with his teachers and then he speaks to his children. The child itself. Shri Narada Vacha Runaivam Pratiprokto Uya Aha Sura Sutam Nachet Guru Bukhi Yante Uto Bhadra Sati Mati So Gurunaivam Pratiprokto When he heard the words of the teachers so here now, earlier it was Guru Putra was referred to. Now it is Guru Guru because they are the son, they are his children, teachers, sons, gurus. So Pratiprokto, when he heard their reply, Bhuya Ahasura Sutam, then he he had initially been speaking to his son because the son was sitting on his lap and he's asking, What did you learn in school today? Then he turned towards the teachers, got angry. But Bhuya, again now he turned towards the son. Aha Asura Sutam Asura Aha means spoke to his son. Nache Guru Mukhiyamte. If your gurus have not taught you this, Mukhiyam means their mouth. If you have not learned this from their mouths, Puto Abhadra Sati Matihi. Then from where, O oh, Abhadra, O oh, Abhadra is auspicious, Abhadra is. Oh, inauspicious one, asati matihi. Where is this devious mentality, this bad inclination come in you from? Where does it come from? Abhadra asati mati. So now these are also strong words to use toward one's own son, to call a son as an inauspicious one. Uh, this kind of things can be, uh, children are very, very uh, vulnerable and impressionable. And if parents speak harsh words to their children, that can cause lifelong psychological damage. So to call a son, uh, sometimes, you know, even this doesn't happen so much with parents, but sometimes uh, people, uh, sometimes other friends or other kids, they might give some hurtful nicknames. And it, and it can just uh, scar a person for life. So, Abhadra Asati Matihi. So, you inauspicious one, how has your mentality become evil like this, become terrible like this? So, you know, good and evil are categories that are there for, for everyone. Of course, different people may have understand, different understandings of what is good and what is evil. That means that say whenever there is any conflict in the past there was the cold war between america and soviet russia so americans would think communism is evil and the communists would think that capitalism is evil and america is the uh, america is the primary engine of capitalism so that is also evil. so the idea is good and evil what people consider good and evil also reflects their own mentality. But these moral categories are there for everyone. Even people who are liberal, they may say, oh, we are liberal, we are broad minded. But liberals will very strongly come down on anyone who uses, for example, politically incorrect speech. And they will say, how could you use such words? That's unacceptable. No, people can lose their jobs, their careers, their tenures just because they use some words which are politically incorrect. So they, all, they, they consider this as evil. So everybody has some categorization of good and bad. 
Now, whether that characterization is valid or not, that depends on the context. So, Prahlad is simply glorifying Vishnu. But Hiranyakashipu says, this is evil. This is horrible. How can you do such a thing like this? So, we go to the next slide now. <clears throat> so, now the next slide, next verse. So now it's our, the main theme of our class is this. Uh, what does uh, Prahlad reply? So Prahlad replies by in three classic verses, which are often quoted by Racharyas, and these verses describe apparently you Prahlad responds in the in what you might seem to be like the worst possible way. He, firstly, it seems, I'll just give a background, then we'll go into the words, that he seems not to answer the question, but to speak something that will provoke, provoke uh, Hiranyakashi. So pra the question to him was, what's, uh, you know, where did you learn this? How did your mentality become like this? So here, what does Prahlan answer? Shri Praharad Vacha Matevina Krishna Paratha Svatova Vitho Vatye Vibraha Pratana Adanta Gobhir Vishutam Tamishram Punha Punashchar Vitachar Panana. So Matir Nakrishne Paratha Svatova. So one's consciousness will not be attracted toward Krishna. Parataha Svatova by other's instructions or one's own endeavor. Satova, mitho avidyate grahavritanam. As long as one's consciousness, one, as long as he, grahavritanam, as long as one is caught in worldly enjoyment, is obsessed with worldly enjoyment, adanta gobhir vishitam tamishram. And in this way, because one's senses are uncontrolled, one will go to hellish conditions. Punha punash charvita charvita. Uh, one will keep craving the same pleasures again and again and again. We will not get anywhere. Puna punash. This last line is often talked about. Puna punash charita charmana. So now, in some ways, Prahlad is basically describing the characters, the behavior and the life of Hiranyakashipu. That uh, you are devoted, you are sold to enjoy your senses and this will take you to hell. So what's going on over here? See, the, I sp spent a significant amount of time talking about the word Naisargekamati in the previous verse. Because this Prahalad is answering the question by, by inverting the premise of the question. So the question is, how did your how did your consciousness get attracted to Vishnu? And Prahalad is answering the question by telling, why is your consciousness not attracted to Vishnu? Actually, attraction to Vishnu is natural. Naisargika Mati. So it's not that I am the I am the odd person out here. It is you all are the out, odd people out. So he inverts the premise of the question. And then he says, so actually, here, Matirna Krishna Parataha Swatova. Parataha and Swato. These two words, if you go back to the previous Sanskrit, Namat Pranitam, Nabara Pranitam. So Matta and Para. So he said that, his teacher said that, I didn't teach, nor did anyone else teach this to him. No need to go back, just keep the same words. So, no need to go back. So, Namat Pranitam, Nabara Pranitam. So, the idea is he's saying that actually uh, one's consciousness is meant to be naturally attracted to Vishnu. If it is not attracted, it won't get attracted if, whether you make efforts or others make efforts for you or there are combined efforts. So Parataha, Swato and Mitho. Parataha is others say, others make you some good instruction. Practice Bhakti, grow in spiritual life, Swato. Yes, I also want to do it. And then Okay, let us both work together. I'll do this. I'll wake up in the morning. I'll do this. Next, I'll do this. And then somebody comes and checks with us. Are you doing this? Are you not doing it? So he says, even then it will not happen. If Graha Pratana, if 
one is determined to continue enjoying worldly pleasures so here prahlad is making a very serious statement he is saying that uh, we all have to make choices in our life that uh, there is the bhagavatam is spoken to hirani to parikshit maharaj is about to die so in that sense parikshit maharaj has to uh, just renounce all thoughts of this world and focus on krishna and krishna the eternal lord so in the, because that is the context of the bhagavatam it is spoken to a person who is about to die so therefore the bhagavatam has an enormous amount of uh, world rejecting uh, stress there are many many verses which simply seem to condemn the world so for example uh, it might say oh family attachment is so dangerous one spouse one's children they are all sources of illusion and entanglement and uh, now it is not that those characters when they are in the grahastha ashram they speak like that to their family members but rather the bhagavat is spoken to a person who is about to die so if somebody is say on their deathbed and they are devoted but they are on the dead but then this at the time of death they start worry it happened once I, i was there the one devotee was nearing his death and his spiritual master was there so do you have any last desires or last uh last fears do you have any last desires so he said that you know he was worried about his family and then the spiritual master told him don't worry about that we will take care we will Uh, we will take care of your family do just don't think of krishna right now so the idea is that at that point if somebody is about to die then you cannot focus too much on the world you have to focus on our journey towards krishna so the, so similarly here when prahlad is speaking that other worldly focus is there he is saying that you if you want to go toward krishna, krishna you cannot go if you hold on to the world now graha vratana maradant gobhir doesn't mean that one doesn't uh, seek to live respectably in the world but it is when he is talking about a situation where chasing worldly pleasures is the is the defining purpose of somebody's life if somebody that's what they think about is the defining purpose of life driving purpose of life and then i think oh, i also want to practice bhakti by the side well then the steady attraction to krishna will not emerge because we will see krishna bhakti through the filter of the fulfillment of our worldly desires now if my goal is to become say the wealthiest person in my my entire family or my entire community or whatever then if that is my goal i also want to practice bhakti by the side but yes sir thing my bhakti is not helping me earn more so much earn money what is the point of doing it so hiranyakashipu has devoted himself totally to the pursuit of power and he is saying because you sold out sold your soul the pursuit of power and pleasure therefore you are your consciousness is not attracted to vishnu and that what are you doing you are thinking this pleasure is so great puna puna charan charan no actually worldly pleasure presents us itself presents itself as new to us but actually it's nothing new we have enjoyed sensual pleasures in many many of our previous lifetimes there's a social commentator who said that news is basically say old things happening to new people so it's not just about sensual pleasure it is also about worldly events that we have to prepare for them and so we have to be stay somewhat aware of them but we didn't have to get we didn't get too obsessed with them because these things are just temporary so we are just doing them again and again and again and they never give any fulfillment punah punash charvita charvana can you go ahead next slide so prahlad is giving almost a fierce reply 
he is refusing to go on the defensive. No, the next, sorry, sorry. My bad. Without next slide, I, can we complete this and then just come to the slide straight? Then go to the next words. I'll complete the two words and we'll come back to the slide straight. So, Prahlad is like replying to fire with fire. He's not being defensive. Oh, why is my consciousness attracted to Vishnu? Why is your consciousness not attracted to Vishnu? This is a natural state. So he says, first thing he says is that it is because you are you have you have you are determined grahavratana. You are determined to enjoy your senses. Then then he next verse he says that why why would why might somebody be so so stubbornly determined to enjoy their senses? That is because they are misled. You are not understanding that your Swarthagati, your ultimate self-interest is in Vishnu. You are thinking of Vishnu as your enemy and you are thinking I am going over to your enemy's side. No. Vishnu is the soul of your soul. Vishnu is your ultimate self-interest. Swartha Gati means uh, the destination that will fulfill our self-interest. Now, Swartha is sometimes translated as selfishness. But sometimes we say, don't be selfish, be selfless. So, this is good message to say, but the, um, biologically speaking and psychologically speaking, we are Biologically speaking, at least we are designed to be uh, survival machines. So, a book on a bio, uh, book by a biologist was the selfish gene that we are all basically selfish. So now we have to speak in a way that makes sense to people. So, if you tell somebody who is very very self-centered, they stop being self-centered, become a little selfless. They will just not be not be able to hear that. But they say, no, actually, your self-interest is in this. So, say, if, uh, what do you mean my self-interest in this? Uh, if, if we can, sh like most people, they say, what's in it for me? So, even when, uh, if we tell people, you know, okay, this is good for the world. Okay, good for the world, let the world do it. Why should I do it? What's in it for me? So, Prahalad. Although he seems to be provocative, he's actually trying to speak in a language that Hiranyakashipu will listen to. He's saying that actually you are interested in yourself. Yes, but your self's interest, your true self-interest is Vishnu. And if you are thinking differently, that is because Durashaya ye You are not understanding that Vishnu is the whole, you are his part, and by satisfying Vishnu, you yourself will be satisfied. But not understanding this, you are chasing after external things. Durashaya, but external search, chasing for externals is never going to give any satisfaction. That we think the externals are what are important. They are valuable. They are what really matter in life. And those who think like this, Andhayathandair upaniyamanas. Andhayathandair. Just as if a blind man carries, uh, leads a blind, another blind person leads another blind person, they will, they will all be misled. And what will happen to them? Tepi ish tantriyam purudam nipad. They become bound by the force of illusion. Ish tantriya is, they come under control of the force of illusion which is controlled by the Lord. Urudam nipadha. And they are very, very difficult to give up. So, what is Prahlad doing over here? The 30th text was, he said actually, uh, attraction to Vishnu is natural, but you are not attracted because you are so materially attached. Now, why are you materially attached? Because you have been misled. Now, of course, Prahlad is doing something very uh, sensitive over here also while he's speaking. But generally, uh, so there is first person is I, second person is you, third person is they. So generally, you know, if we want to connect with the audience, 
then we don't say you do this. No, we should all do this. We all can do this. So we don't speak down to the audience, but rather we speak with them, we join them. But if you want to bash someone, you people are all foolish. No, what we do is we use a third person. The people who think like this are not very intelligent. So what happens is now the audience might also have people who think like that. But if we say you think like this, it's a direct attack on that person. How dare you criticize me? Hey, yeah, so think like that. Am I like that kind of person? So, but the ego is not the the wise person will understand what is being spoken, but it can be spoken without agitating the ego. So Prahlad, what is he doing? He is not refer using the second person at all. He's using the third person. So there are people who are materially attached and their consciousness never attracted to Vishnu. Now, why are they so materially attached? Because they have been misled. And because they're misled, the Andhayathan, the blind led the blind. And then they got so covered by illusion that they don't understand things only. They are bound by the forces of illusion. So in a sense, he is telling Hrinikashipu, it's not that you are to be blamed, rather you have been misled and then you have been covered over by the force of illusion. And then in the last words, which we will be discussing today, can we go to 30 second words? He says, if somebody is covered by illusion like this, what is the way out of that illusion? And so Naisham Matis, the Mati of these people, na Esham, Tavat Urukram Angri, unto Urukram Angri, unto the lotus feet of the Supreme Lord, who is called Urukrama, one who has can take giant steps that can refer to Vamanadev whose three steps cover the whole universe, or it can refer to, Krama can also refer to deeds, one who can do extraordinary deeds generically. So the consciousness will not be attracted to the Supreme Lord. Sprishyatya anartha pagamo yadarthaha. So, anartha apagama. The anarthas will not disappear from the heart. So, bahir arthamaninaha, one who think, to think that the externals are what matter in life, to bahir artha, is anartha. It is undesirable in life. Anartha pagamo yadarthaha. So those anarthas will not go away till what point? Unless one bathes oneself in the dust of the lotus feet of the great souls. What are the characteristics of the great souls? Nishkinchananam navrutayavarat. Those who are nishkinchana, those who have no attachment to anything material. So, what Prahlad is saying is that attraction to the material will not decrease unless we sum submit to those who have no attraction to the material. Those who have devoted themselves to the transcendental, if we submit to them, then our worldly attachments will go away. So, actually, Prahlad is in three verses, succinctly describing Hiranyakashipu's predicament and is also offering a solution. And he, 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 he doesn't tell who has done this, to, who has uh, taught him this, why is his conscious naturally attracted. He doesn't say that, oh, Narada Muni taught me in the womb. So he doesn't want to get his teacher into trouble. So he, he tells this, he mentions this, uh, we could say indirectly to his students, to, to his other friends, not students, uh, the co-students, uh, but that we will see that in the next chapter. But in this chapter, here, a, a Prahlad is not trying to get himself off the hook. Oh, you know, I'm an innocent child. Narad Muni taught me this. That's why I'm, and I don't be angry with me, you know, just play Narad Muni. He does not mention Narad Muni at all. What does he do? He gives a philosophical answer, but he gives a hint of the solution. He says that, I have heard from Narad Muni. So now, Padarajobhishekam, to bathe oneself in the dust of the lotus feet, actually, it essentially means, it, can, it means having a service attitude and serving the great souls. Serving the great souls can be 
literally doing some seva for them it can also be hearing from them it is said that uh, the <clears throat> what what blessings come from the dust of the lotus feet they also come from the words from the lotus mouth of the great souls so if we hear their words and try to understand and apply those words hear them in service attitude the same purification can also come so let's go to the slide show now so this is the discussion that was there on the scripture 25 to 32 verses first hiranya kashipu says that uh, why are you teaching him like this and they say it's not our it's not because of us it's it's prahlad's nature so now we will try to see how prahlad responded in terms of uh, practicals so here there was a concept which i was going to speak but i don't think can you go ahead skip this it's not be so clear um see broadly there are three kinds of responses we might have so whenever any situation comes in our life we might be assertive aggressive or passive so assertive response is in the mode of goodness aggressive response is in the mode of passion and passive is in the mode of ignorance essentially i say if somebody criticizes us somebody at attacks us so passive means we just let the other person walk over us oh you know okay what can i do you are powerful and powerless we just let the other person walk over us and we let ourselves be victimized and traumatized by that person that is that is unhealthy now the aggressive response is you did this to me i will do this to you if i can't do this to now right now i will i will get power and i'll hit back at so if we consider say some person is angry or oppressive the passivity simply increases the oppressiveness of the person but aggressiveness it simply increases the conflict it simply you did this to me i did this to you and it just goes on and on and on so what we need to be is assertive sometimes we think that being spiritual means that we should be tolerant we should be forgiving and yes that is true we should be tolerant and forgiving but we often have certain preconceptions of what tolerance forgiveness or humility mean and based on those preconceptions uh, we might choose a response that is passive and you may think that actually we are being spiritual but we are not being spiritual we are simply being passive we are, we are acting in the mode of ignorance and thinking that we are uh, we are acting in a transcendent way so uh, basically can we move forward so humility so hiranyakashipu was of course arrogant he thought that he deserved worship he deserved respect and prahlad was humble we understand that they are, they are black and white characters but prahlad's humility doesn't come out as passivity so how how is he how does his humility come out can you go ahead so humility is not servility it is not that oh you, know, you just become a servile uh, servile honor of the other person that is not a sycophant it's not that's not humility the essence of humility is that the ego doesn't come in the way of our service that means if for my surveys i have to take a particular stand i will take that stand uh, but if say somebody is insulting me personally i will tolerate it but if somebody is interfering with my surveys then the service has to be done and i will i will uh, not let my ego determine the response you spoke this to me i will speak this to you no not like that we can look at this in shri prabhupad's life also the prabhupad often we hear of him and we may think of him as a simha guru as he this as he said his spiritual master was and he himself simha was simha guru means the loyal teacher that he was very strong and cutting but it is not that prabhupad was always like that but the point of prabhupad was that whatever was required for uh doing his service he did that so there are times in prabhupad for example if he reads his book easy journey to other planets now uh, he he uh is speaking to scientist and he speaks in a very uh 
very conciliatory, very uh, appealing tone. He says, we would like to submit to our scientist friends that there is that there is advanced knowledge even in the Vedic scriptures. So we beg to submit. Prabhupada would often use that phrase, we beg to submit or I beg to submit, something like that. So we might say that is just the usage of English that Prabhupada learned at that time. It could be, but Prabhupada used that still. He didn't have to stick to that convention. So the idea is, Prabhupada, there was humility at times. But that does not mean that he did not take strong positions. So for example, when Prabhupada came to India, and there are many programs being organized, so the devotees uh, had some of his female disciples had gone to Jaipur to get a set of deities. Right? Jaipur is the place to get deities. So when they would go to the while they were waiting for the deities to be made, they would go to the daily to the Radha Govind temple, and they would do kirtans over there. And in that time, in the 1970s, these Western women wearing saris and doing Hare Krishna kirtan, it created a sensation. And many of the patrons of that temple they came and talked. And they were very impressed with the sincerity and the devotion of these ladies. And then they said, what can we, uh, what can we do to serve you? Says, Get our spiritual master here. And so organize some programs for him. They said, said, we'll happily do this. And they organized a grand pandal program. Prabhupada was so pleased. And Prabhupada was proud of his disciples. He said that, you know, these ladies, they are so amazing. That they just went there to do some meetings and now they organized a big program for me. He, he wrote me letters and spoke to his guests about how resourceful his, his disciples were, and especially in this case, how when his female disciples were doing extraordinary things. So then he came there, uh, then he saw the pamphlets that the devotees had made over there. And this it was. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada and his foreign disciples. And Prabhupada was a little annoyed by this. Why foreign disciples? Prabhupada said, put their American and British disciples. So now we say, why does he have to put that specifically? See, uh, the point here was Prabhupada had a particular vision. Prabhupada had tried a long time to, sp to spread Krishna Bhakti in India. And people had just not been interested. So then he went to America, he went to the Western world, and he inspired Western people to become devotees. And because India was enamored by the West, Prabhupada felt if the West takes it up, then Indians will also take it up on seeing how Western people are taking it up. So that was a central to his, you could say, his strategy of outreach. And just generic foreign is not as impressive to Indians as is they. Uh, America and uh, Britain. So, yes, now I'm based in India, I travel across the world. So from India, many people go abroad. Some people, if, especially if they go to the Middle East, they say, I'm going abroad. They don't advertise, I'm going to the Middle East. Because the Middle East is not considered a particularly glamorous destination. So they just generically say, we go abroad. We are going abroad for work. We are going abroad for this or that. And they say, you press them, then they will be the small place, actually, I'm going to the Middle East. They don't, uh, but if somebody's going to America, it's like, oh, I'm going to the spiritual world. They're so proud of it. So there was this nationalistic sentiment that was there. And Prabhupada wanted to channel that so that more and more people would get attracted and come for the programs and then hear his message. His message was not American. His message, message was universal. So, but Prabhupada, when it was required that for his service, he take a particular position, he took that position. There was another time when a devotee was fixing up some, fixing up the room in which Prabhupada was staying. And they had to, Chadurani Mataji, she came to Prabhupada and she said that, uh, Prabhupada, you know, we, have, we want to put this picture of uh, your spiritual master uh, above you, behind you. So can I step on your seat? And Prabhupada said, for the service of Krishna, you can step on my head also. And Prabhupada didn't say it like that. Prabhupada actually meant it for the service of Krishna. Anything he was ready to do. That same Prabhupada, he, he was 
when he was on the streets of Delhi, he would go out in the heat and distribute back to world magazines. So for a devotee, the service is important. And for the service, if one's ego is to be wounded, a devotee can take the ego to be wounded. But if for the service, one has to take a firm position, that doesn't mean that one is letting, one is being not being humble or one is being arrogant. It is, one has to be service. So Prahalad, why is this always discussion important? Prahalad in this context, what is he doing? He's saying, thinking, what is important here? Now, how can, how can I enlighten my father? How can I help my father understand that he is, is on the path to self-destruction? That he, it is, his ultimate interest is in devotion to Vishnu. So that's why he's giving an answer like this. So Prahalad is not like picking a fight with his father by being arrogant. He's neither passive nor is he aggressive. He's assertive. Can you go ahead? He's being assertive. And when we are assertive in this way, essentially what happens by this is that uh, sometimes being assertive means we may speak strong words. So it's like performing surgery. The surgery has to be performed with care. So sometimes we have to cut through people's illusions, but it's like surgery. Sadhu's words are said to be like a knife, which a surgical knife that cuts, but it has to be done carefully. When nothing else is likely to work, surgery is never the first go-to treatment. Try other treatments, if none of them work, then do surgery. So like similarly over here, Prahlad is doing this. So the, uh, the idea over here is that a devotee, he cannot stereotype a devotee. Although Prahlad is a small devotee, physically speaking, he has a great art. He has great faith, great courage, great wisdom. And with that, he's responding to Hiranyakashipu's questions. Prahlad is a model for all devotees. And we all can seek to learn from his example of how we can also practice bhakti in a way that enriches and uplifts us. So for us, in our situation, we can contemplate you know, when somebody provokes us, somebody makes us, uh, angers us, is our response just, I want to get back to you or is it, I am powerless, what can I do? But is it that, okay, what is my service over here? What is my purpose over here? And how can I respond best so that my purpose is there? If you keep that, position, that thought in mind, we'll be able to find a constructive way ahead. So I'll summarize what I spoke today. So we, we talked about a conversation between Prahalad, uh, between Hiranyakashipu, Shanda Amarka, and Prahalad. So it began with Hiranyakashipu first holding Shanda and Amarka responsible. So the behavior of children, often their guardians are held responsible for that. Shanda and Amarka disown responsibility by saying that this is, this is natural for it. Then and then we discuss about nature nurture discussion. Then nicer Gikiniti. And then I discussed about okay, it's natural, what does it mean? So we discussed about how uh, Prahlad's answer is assertive. He answers that actually uh, that this is natural even for you, but you don't feel this natural attraction to Vishnu because you are misdirected. Because your consciousness is misdirected, because of being materially attached, because of being misled. And, but if you submit to devotees, you can also be led properly. And we concluded by discussing about aggressive, assertive, and passive behaviors. And humility doesn't mean servility. Humility means to not let our ego come in the way of our service. And by focusing on our service, we can respond appropriately to provocative behavior from others. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. So are there any, so there is this exercise. This is what I mentioned. So are there any, this is a take home exercise which you could conceivably do later and internalize what we discussed. Are there any questions? Hi Krishna Prabhu. Hare Krishna Dandavai. 
don't know if I pronounce this is Yadunath Das. Um, Radigol, it's not true. Good to hear from you. Humble Hare Krishna, Felix, have my humble obeisances. Close to Prabhupada. Obeisances. Thank you. For I have started. I have started. Yes, I have started my video now. In, is that in, is that affecting the audio in a negative way or it's clear enough? Uh, it's clear for me. It's clear. Okay. Um, okay. I was just uh, curious. You know, um, I can, I can easily believe that Krishna lifted Govardhan Hill with his pinky. And uh, I can even believe that um, Hanuman leapt over the sea, eight miles or whatever it was. Um, but sometimes I have this sort of innate resistance to believing um, a five-year-old boy um, behaving like this, thinking like this, articulating himself like this, etc. cetera. Um, I'm wondering, is there a specific point why Krishna chose to play this uh, to play this out through a five-year-old boy? Is it just um, that you know, for for anyone who's sincere, no matter what age, no matter what material circumstance, that um, he can reach the highest uh, level of realization? Or, or um, can you help me at all? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. So, how can we understand that a five-year-old boy can behave like this? Why does Krishna use a five-year-old child for this pastime? It generally, okay, uh, let's go for specifics and then go to universal. Specifics is that Prahlad himself will tell later in the 10th chapter, one of the verses when he's uh, talking with Hiranyakashipu, at that time he says, my dear Lord, you have sent me to this world to demonstrate the principles of pure devotional service. So, Prahalad is, uh, in that sense, an eternal associate of the Lord. He already has great devotion. And this is something which is not just the behavior of a five-year-old child. This is actually the behavior of a very spiritually evolved soul who happens to be in a five-year-old body. So, yes, there is, see, there is, there is biology and there is spirituality. And in normal cases, the at least for a certain amount of time, the biology uh, trumps the spirituality. Biology, I don't want to use the word trumps. I supersedes the spirituality, eclipses the spirituality. So, by the way, is my video visible to you? Or yeah. am I visible? Okay. I can see. Thank you. So, so, for most people, it is the biology that matters the most. Say, most children they will grow up and later on they may become devotees. But we see in certain cases, like uh, Bharat Maharaj also, uh, when he became a deer, he had a deer's body biologically, but his consciousness was evolved. Mm. And thus, as a deer, he would not just stay with uh, other people, uh, with other deer, but he would stay near the sages' hermitage and hear spiritual sound vibrations from them. So in the case of Prahala, certainly this is not the behavior of an ordinary five-year-old child. And we shouldn't expect that our children will be like this. Or if our children are not like this, we shouldn't think that we are not good parents. No, this is extraordinary behavior coming from a previous life. Not just a previous life, but it's coming from the spiritual world actually. So that's the specific explanation for Prahlad's context. Now, overall, the Bhagavatam has one theme running through it. That is, it inverts all conventional notions of hierarchy. That means who is better and who is worse. Because that inversion is an ongoing theme in the Bhagavad Say for example, it's the seventh canto. In the sixth canto, there is this conflict between Vritrasur and Indra. So normally the, the Asuras are bad people and the Devatas are good people. But here, it's inverted. The Asura is a great soul. The demon is actually a person a demonic body is a great soul because the demon has devotion. Similarly, in the eighth canto, if you see there's a story of uh, multiple stories. If we consider there is a story again of Bali Maharaj, who actually is blessed by Vamanadev because Vamanadev becomes his doorkeeper, although he's a demon. Then we have Ambarish Maharaj and Durvasan. So Ambarish Maharaj is a 
Kshatriya and a Grahastha, whereas he is a Durasman is a Sanyasi and a, Brahman, and a Sanyasi and a Brahman. But still, Ambarish Maharaj is higher. Why? Because he has devotion. So here, if we see in terms of, in this past time, Prahala's interactions are described first with Hiranyakashipu, and they are then they are described with the Devtas. Devtas offer prayers, but they don't satisfy Vishnu. It is, it is uh, Prahlad who will satisfy Vishnu. So what happens is, in terms of physical might, Prahalad is no match to Hiranyakashipu. In terms of exalted birth, Prahalad is no match to Devtas. But still, Prahalad is able to, Prahalad shines as stronger than Hiranyakashipu and stronger than the Devtas also, more influential than the Devtas. So the Bhagavatam's theme is that devotion supersedes all other material considerations. There are material considerations that we, that create certain hierarchies in this world. There, but if there is devotion, the whole hierarchy gets inverted. And that's what is demonstrated through using a five-year-old child to uh, demonstrate such superlative devotion. Thank you very much. And uh, just, uh, lastly, I would just like to thank you for your perspective on um, sort of, uh, for lack of a better phrase, householder bashing. Um, that it's uh, <laughs> it's spoken to someone who's about to die. So that's, uh, I really appreciate that perspective. Thank you. Happy to be of service. Do we have time for any other questions? Sure, we can hold a minute or two for any uh, additional questions, reflections, shares, if anyone would like to share anything. So I don't want to go over time and actually speaking of the verses and explaining those verses took a lot of time. That's why we couldn't have much discussion, but I hope that this gives you a perspective about the richness of the Bhagavatam itself. Now, we can learn lessons from the Bhagavatam, but just the Bhagavatam itself is filled with so much sweetness and wisdom. So if we look at the Sanskrit and try to understand it, just focus on the narrative. The narrative is filled with a lot of freshness and insight and drama. So I wanted to give a glimpse of that also in of these verses. So thank you very much. Shri Narasimha Dev Bhagwan Ki Jai. Shri Prahlad Maharaj Ki Jai. Shri Prabhupad Ki Jai. So once again, we are so uh, grateful to and uh, appreciative of Chaitanya Charan Prabhu for sharing with us. Please join us uh, next week, next Sunday at the same time, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time for the next installment. We'll be continuing on with this section of the Bhagavatam. And uh, I believe our speaker for next week is uh, Kostuba Prabhu. But look out for uh, emails and notes on uh, the Bhakti Center's uh, social media channels. Um, and I'm, I have uh, once again shared the screen. So uh, we would invite you to uh, just take note of this reflection exercise. Uh, this is an aspect of the Bhagavad Shravana program that we're really hoping to uh, lean more into and, and encourage and emphasize uh, as we continue on with this program to take the essence of what each speaker has shared with us um, as, <clears throat> excuse me, a, a starting point or a launch pad for how we can apply these lessons or examine them in our own life throughout the week. So we invite you to do that. And, and here's a beautiful reflection exercise. And uh, we hope you're able to join us again next week where we can um, perhaps uh, return to this uh, reflection exercise and uh, continue on in our wonderful journey with Prahlad Maharaj leading up to the uh, divine appearance of Sri Nirsingadev. So thank you all so much. Grantarachimad Bhagavatam ki jai, Shalapropad ki jai. Uh, see you all next week. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hi, Krishna.